Good morning, church. I am so glad to be here with you this morning. I'm glad to be worshiping and praying, glad to be present with you. There have been a lot of anniversary type things in the last week that have felt kind of heavy and serious. Top of mind for a lot of us is yesterday, which was the 20th anniversary of the plane hijackings on September 11th, 2001. I'll be honest, it brings up a lot of mixed feelings for me, and I imagine for some of you as well. I remember the huge loss of life, the many thousands of people that rushed in to help, the sense of unity, the groundswell of folks across the country volunteering to give blood in the days and weeks afterwards. I also remember the roller coaster of decisions to use military force in response. And I remember the images of just a few weeks ago, people trying to leave Afghanistan. All of what has come, all of what continues to happen, it's all still with us. This week was also a year after the Orange Day, if you remember last year, the day that the sky darkened into twilight over the course of the morning instead of getting brighter and the street lights stayed on all day. I remember the tightness in my chest, my whole body telling me we need to get out of here, even though I was safe and had access to clean air indoors. I've spent a lot of time in the last year reflecting on that, the way that my body knows how to be a creature in my ecosystem, even as my brain tries to pretend that I'm somehow separated. So this week, we're gonna be locals here on this beautiful land. I wanna acknowledge now the land where I sit to lead worship this morning is the traditional and unceded territory of the Lischen Ohlone people who have stewarded this land for many generations and continue to do so. I pay honor to the people who know this ecosystem intimately. I'm grateful to be here and committed to working towards right relations. If you're not on Ohlone land with me, I invite you to post in the chat on whatever platform you're on whose traditional land you are on. And if you don't know, I invite you to take this moment to find out. The internet can tell you this information and this is something we should know. And as you do that, I also invite you to light your first church candle if you've got it or another one in recognition of the spirit that draws all people towards unity. God is with us. We are not alone. And I offer you this morning the light of Christ's peace, which is beyond all of our understanding. And whether this is your first or your 500th service here at First Church Berkeley UCC, let me tell you this. You are so welcome here. You are welcome if you have lived in the same place your entire life, or if you've been hopping from one place to another, or a little bit of each. You are welcome if your ideal life would be 100% outdoors or 100% indoors or a little bit of each. You're welcome if you're full of hope and action and motivation about climate change or if you're sitting in grief and despair right now or a little bit of each. Welcome this morning to poets and artists, engineers, musicians, doctors, teachers, nurses, lawyers, makers of things and sellers of things, judges, cleaners, authors, speakers. Welcome to garbage collectors and farmers, city council members and scientists, activists and advocates. Welcome to parents and children. Welcome to people of all races, all family configurations, all body shapes and sizes, all abilities and disabilities, all languages of origin, all citizenship statuses. Welcome to you, your whole self exactly as you are because you are here right now in this moment across time and space this particular body of christ that we are co-creating together is whole and perfect thank you for what you bring to this body welcome of course if you are live with me on sunday morning september 12th at 10 a.m pacific and welcome if you're worshiping in the future when i'm already in the past Either way, it's so great if you can let us know you're out there. I know that you can see me, I cannot see you. So you have to let me know that you're out there if you want 
You can like the service or share the service on social media so that other people can find us. You can fill out the welcome form. The link is in the comments um, so that we can be up to date on your life so that we know how to get in touch with you. Um, you can get in the comments if that's your thing. In addition to saying good morning, as we often do, I want to ask you to share one thing you love about the natural landscape where you live, whether you live here with me on a lonely land or whether you live somewhere else. Um, what is one thing that you love? Here's mine. I love the microclimates around here. I am endlessly fascinated by how you can travel such a short distance and the weather can be so different. I love that I can drive 15 minutes from my house and change temperature 20 degrees or more. And as you share, as always, we'll prepare our hearts and our bodies to worship this morning by starting with song. Our opening hymn today is For the Beauty of the Earth. So let's sing together. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, Lord of all, to Thee we raise this star hymn of grateful praise for the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night hill and vale and tree and cloud sun and moon and stars of light Lord of all to thee we raise this our hymn of great Telling the glory of God, and all creation is showing God's walk. Day after day they tell their story, and night after night they reveal the depth of their understanding. Without speech, without words, without even an audible voice, their cry echoes through all the world, and their messages reach the end of the earth. For in the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun, which comes out with the beauty of a wedding party, and runs its course with joy, like an athlete. It rises at one end of the sky and travels to the other end, and nothing is away from its wall. Your law, O oh God, is perfect. It refreshes the soul. Your rule is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. Your purposes, O oh God, are right. They make the heart glad. Your command is clear, giving light to the eyes. Our awe of you is pure, O oh God, and lasts forever. Your decrees are steadfast, and all of them are fair and just. They are more precious than gold, the purest and most beautiful gold, and sweeter than honey. Honey right off the honeycomb. Your degrees teach us how to live, and we find great reward in following them. Can we detect our own failings? God, forgive what I've done wrong that I don't even know about. Keep your faithful ones from being fooled of ourselves, so our faults do not control us. Then we can be good, and we will be innocent of serious things. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O oh God, my rock, my rock, and my redeemer. Good morning, friends. I'm so happy to see you. Well, I know I can't really see you, but I can imagine you there. I can feel you there. I can almost touch you. Hey, where do you think I'm coming to you from today? Where do you imagine? that I am. Maybe I can spin a little bit and give you a better view. You're right. I'm in the woods. Where are these woods? Do you know? 
I bet you can't guess. These woods are in New York City. The New York City. I'm here in Central Park in the woods in New York City. A city of more than 8 million people. One of the most crowded compact cities in the world. But here's all this beautiful nature. You know, last week, you might have heard or seen on TV or seen somewhere that there was a big hurricane, a giant rainstorm that passed through New York City and the water was everywhere and it happened so fast and it was very scary and it was very stressful. And sometimes weather does that. It really stresses us out. Sometimes the earth feels like it's really hurting and we can feel really scared about that. We can feel like there's no safe place to go. There's no place to relax. Well, our friends in Japan have an idea that they, something they've been doing for hundreds of years and they call it forest bathing. Not taking a bath in the forest, it's, it's going to the forest and letting the forest just kind of feel like it's washing you clean, just washing off the stress, just letting it all go. And you know, you don't have to go all the way into the wilderness to do it. In fact, they say it's better if you go to a green place a nature place right near the city, right in the edges and the nooks and crannies of the city because that way you can remember that nature's always right there for us, that God gave us this to appreciate and celebrate and to help restore our souls wherever we are. We don't have to take a two week backpacking trip to Yosemite to experience the gift of nature. But there is one thing you do have to do wherever you are and I hope you'll join me in doing it right now. We're gonna take off our shoes so that we can actually touch this place where we are. And we're gonna walk around just for a minute in our bare feet. And we're gonna feel ourselves connected to the soil and the grass and the microbes and the little worms and everything that's in there. We're gonna feel ourselves one with it. We're gonna let that energy, that good energy come up from the earth and right into the, to our feet and to our whole body. So, um, will you do that with me just for a minute? Let's go. around for a minute. I know you're probably indoors, but you can practice for later. You know that we learn a lot through our feet, that our feet have a lot of the bones that are in our body and a lot of ways of feeling, a lot of nerves. And this is a way we can draw close to God. And this is a spiritual practice we can use when we're feeling stressed about anything, but especially about the earth that we live in and on. Go for us, baby, right where you are. Let's pray. God, creator of all good, who's still creating, who calls us to create with you, and sometimes when we're out of steam, to stop creating and just let ourselves be blessed by all you have made. When we're scared, overwhelmed, tired, restless, remind us to take off our shoes, to go to the closest nature place to walk around and feel you through our feet, always present. Amen. Love you so much. Hope to see you soon.
Friends, I want to tell you a little story about when I first got here. I moved here to Berkeley a little bit more than five years ago, at the end of August 2016, um, from Toronto. And so this was a really different environment. And I'd never been, I'd never really spent any time in this ecosystem before. I had visited, but I'd never really spent any time. And my partner, Cheryl, and I decided to go for a hike right away after we got here. We decided to go for a hike. We found a park. We picked out a park. We picked out Sibley Volcanic Regional Park because we thought that sounded so interesting. A volcanic park. Hmm. What does it mean? And we got there, parked, we put on our hiking boots. And I have no words to tell you about how dry things were. I don't think I had ever been in a park where it felt so dry. The grasses all looked completely dead to me. And the ground was so dusty and everything was just parched. I felt thirsty as soon as I got out of the car. I didn't understand the story that that park was telling. I could hardly take it in, really. I just had this overwhelming sense of dryness, almost to panic, almost a sense of like, how can I, how can I live here? How can anyone live? How can anything live here in a place where it is so dry? I was honestly a little bit alarmed when I came home from that hike. I just felt like, what is this place? And to be fair, not only was it late August, but it was late August 2016, when we were really in kind of a drought moment, just like we're in right now. In fact, Sibley pretty much looks the same right now. But it reminded me a little bit of how I generally have felt. A lot of the time when I think about climate change, this feeling of how can we live here? How can anything live here? How can we live inside of a house on fire? That sense of panic, that sense of impossibility. It was not possible at that moment because I was so new and I didn't know how to understand what I was seeing. It was really difficult for me to figure out how how anyone could live here. With climate change, we try to make sense of it. We try, we try to figure out an, a, a direction to look, you know, a place to rest our gaze, to allow us to live. I think some of us have a tendency to be techno optimists, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll find some technology that's going to solve this. We're going to engineer our way out of this climate crisis. That was the orientation that I was certainly taught in my undergrad in environmental engineering. We'll figure it out. We'll iterate. We'll get the technology better, and it will allow us to, you know, more or less live the way that we live, but without the damage. We'll get there, you know. These days, I think I tend towards probably the other um, orientation that people take, which is nostalgia, really looking back, looking at the past with this sense of, you know, oh, remember when, remember when the park used to be greener, remember when the reservoirs were full, remember when that beautiful favorite trail hadn't burned. Nostalgia, the etymology of that word, nostalgia is the pain, alja, the pain of returning home. Nostos is Greek for, for returning home, going home. The, the painful longing to be able to go back to a place, particularly around climate change, the painful longing to go back to a place that we cannot go back to. Time doesn't work that way. We don't have the opportunity to go that direction. And there is some real pain, some real longing in that. All the beautiful places that we know that will not be as they were that will never be the same. 
sometimes when I look back, I feel like my, my youth and young adulthood were a series of moments of nostalgia for things that I knew wouldn't come back. Animals going extinct, climates changing in places that made it so that you couldn't do what you used to be able to do. Beautiful things that I knew I would not be able to see. Nevertheless, the psalmist says in our reading for today, and this is the lectionary psalm for today, the heavens are telling the glory of God and all creation is showing God's work. Day after day, they tell their story and night after night, they reveal the depth of their understanding, their wordless understanding. Day after day, they are telling a story. It's a story about God and God's creation and the world, and it's not the story that I'm telling. I remember in the early days of the pandemic, when things were changing so fast, things were just rushing, you know, news item after news item, and it felt like every single grain of my attention was taken up by this pandemic what to do and how to keep each other safe and things were changing so fast and for a few weeks i think really probably three weeks we pretty much stayed at home because that's what they were saying to do and we walked in the neighborhood and i just felt overwhelmed and after a few weeks we decided to go for a hike on mount diablo a big hike 13 miler it took the whole day and after a few hours, I realized that it was the first time that I was around things, beings that were not consumed by anxiety about the pandemic. Birds and bees and bugs and squirrels and deer and turkeys, plants and rushing water were all going about their business, living their lives and not at all worried about COVID-19. And there was something really helpful to that, to me. Just the idea that there was a whole world that was not consumed by the things that I was consumed by. Some perspective, there were other things happening. There were other lives equally precious, equally interesting to God, consumed by different things. And it made me think about how precious it is that we have these places that are saved for us to go to, that are not entirely shaped by modern Western ways of living, to have some space for us to get outside of our own heads. Those places were saved in a lot of cases through the labors of early environmentalists, especially in our area. Um, people like John Muir, who was in the past one of my real heroes um, and whose writing I still cherish in certain ways. Um, and yet, whose work is driven in a certain way by a, a primary fallacy which is the idea that any impact of human life must be negative, that the best case is that the world wouldn't notice us at all, that wilderness is valuable only when it is not touched at all by human hands or feet, that the best places have no trail, that the best places have no impact. This to me, their key insight, the key insight that natural environment has, has its own intrinsic worth, not just as raw materials, that key insight is still so important and so helpful. And yet, there is this kind of flawed theological anthropology, this flawed idea of, hu of, of who humans are that's baked into it, this idea that if any impact comes from humans, it must be negative. 
And I only learned to identify that thought as something, something that's not necessarily true uh, by reading a different author. A few years ago, I came across the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And uh, Kimmerer suggests that many indigenous cultures had an understanding of humans as beneficial parts of our ecosystem that humans might help, humans might make things better, humans might spread seeds so that beneficial plants, not just beneficial to us, but beneficial to the, the whole working of the ecosystem might spread and might thrive, that we might plant things to help um, streams be cooler for fish, that we might actually have a beneficial idea and in fact, I listened to a lecture on um, Robin Wall Kimmer was on a live stream, I don't know, six months ago, maybe. And somebody asked a question about this very thing. I gather I'm not the only um, person who was very moved by this idea. And she said, don't cite me. Don't cite me on this idea. This idea that humans can be good instead of bad. Um, this isn't a unique idea. This is known. This predated that other idea. Cite the new idea, the wrong idea that humans can only be bad. Cite that instead. Mark that as a human invention, as not neutral, as not original. This was helpful to me. And so because of that, I have turned to trying to read nature like scripture to trying to read the natural environment around me as a source for understanding who I am and who God is. I am learning to listen to the story that the heavens and creation are telling me. I am learning to hear the fog tell the story of God's compassion and the redwoods tell the story of God's gentleness and faithfulness. Redwood trees make their own microclimates, you know. Their needles spread out like feathers to help the fog condense. So they create a little rain shower. They soak in some of the moisture through their bark and through their needles, but they also direct it to their own roots by causing their own little tiny rainstorms when there's no rain falling. And other plants, like redwood sorrel, which almost looks like this beautiful carpet of clover, grow underneath them, like a green, a green carpet, drinking that rain that's left over when the redwood trees make it rain. It's a blessing that the trees offer to their environment. I am learning to participate in my own environment, to pick up things that don't belong when I see them, to spread seeds when appropriate, to plant flowers in my raised beds in my own garden to help pollinators know they're welcome, to help my plants by pruning them so that they can thrive. I'm learning to make the most out of a little bit of water. In other words, after five years, I'm learning to be a local. I'm learning to live here and to pay attention because I think at least for me, attention is the antidote to climate despair. It's a little bit cliche, I don't know, to share Mary Oliver, but I'm not above loving Mary Oliver's poetry. And in one of her most overused, but still very precious poems, uh, she says, tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. And so I say, meanwhile, even as I tell my despair, meanwhile, the redwoods water the sorrel that grows at their toes. Meanwhile, the birds enjoy and spread the seeds of the California poppies in my yard. 
Meanwhile, the sun runs its race across the sky, granting warmth and light and energy to everything it touches. And meanwhile, I walk here on this good land every week in park after park, and I learn the names of my plant and animal neighbors here. And I get to know this place, and I get to know its seasons. Like a local, I rejoice in even a tenth of an inch of rain at 4 a.m. Like a local, I know what weather pattern will bring on a bushel of tomatoes ripening at once. It's like a local, I know what the day will be like when it starts with fog or clear sky or wind. I went back to Sibley a couple of weeks ago. This is exactly the season when I first visited it. The driest of dry seasons after a dry winter. The, gra the grasses that you see when you go there are completely blonde and flattened down and the dust is thick on the fire road trails and the sky, and there was no smoke, was impossibly blue. And I could see it as beautiful. And I could see that those grasses have stored up their energy in their roots for when water will wake them up again. And now I can see the tiny flowers that are still growing in between, finding some bit of moisture to be able to thrive. And now I can see how the contours of the hills shape where trees grow, where wind might be stronger or weaker, where different trees thrive. I'm starting to be able to see like a local here, which means I'm starting to be able to hear the story that this good land is telling. And as I start to be able to see I can also start to be able to see a place for myself and other people. I'm learning what grows here. I'm learning what I can do to bless the environment instead of cursing it, to be a part of my ecosystem, to live here and to pay attention. I'm starting to be able to hear and understand the wordless story that this land is telling. And part of that story is this, we are not alone. We are created beings among other created beings. And that is a good place. That is a hopeful place. That is a place to start. And I'm grateful for it. Friends, let's take a moment to pray together as we always do. I invite you to take a few deep breaths. So maybe stretch your toes out and imagine them if you are indoors right now, reaching down through your floor into the earth beneath, <laughs> below and beneath you, um, into that good earth. I invite you to take a moment to allow the turbulent waters of your heart to still to be present here and now so that you might be more aware of what's on your heart that you might need to pray for. You can share your prayers with your community if you want to by putting them in the chat. You can also share your prayers aloud. God will hear you. You can also hold your prayers close to your heart or pray beyond words. God is with you with where, whatever way you're going to pray. Let's begin this morning by praying for our intricately connected ecosystems in the face of climate change. God, we pray, grant resilience. Be present in quotidian ways and miraculous ways. Calm the fires and bring rain to our parched land here. Soften the winds of hurricanes and make ways for floodwaters to drain. We place in your hands all those bearing, 
bearing the heaviest impact right now. In particular, this morning, we pray for our prayer partner church in New Orleans, Bethlehem Lutheran Church, whose members and neighbors have suffered greatly in Hurricane Ida's wake, as well as all those who are suffering throughout the Gulf Coast and the Northeast in the aftermath of this hurricane. May all of them know your holy mercy and grace. We also pray with grief and with love for all the beloved places that have been lost to fires this year, for camps and cabins, homes and trails. We thank God for all the years of love and delight in these places. And we ask God for balm to soothe the sharpest pain of loss, to turn our nostalgia into action and attention. We pray this week in sorrow and solidarity, in recognition and memory of all those lives that were lost on September 11th, for all those lost in the ensuing conflict and wars, and for all of God's people throughout time and throughout the world, yearning for peace, security, and safety. God, we ask, protect your people and guide us towards peace. So pray this morning in gratitude for all of our ancestors, for our ancestors in faith, for our ancestors in activism, and for our physical ancestors whose lives made our lives possible. We especially pray this morning for grandparents. God, we thank you for the gifts of extra love, extra time, and extra attention that grandparents can offer. We ask your blessing on all those relationships. And we continue to place in God's hands all the members of our local, our close community, our hearts, who are suffering, who are ill, and who need God's presence. We continue to pray for Bernice Brissett, who's in hospice. We ask God to help Bernice know our love and our care in this transitional season of her life. We pray for her family as well. We continue to pray for Melissa, Casey, Ashley, and Mateo, and Ani and Brittany, the family our accompaniment team has been accompanying, and for Melissa and Ani's cousins as well, and for all our siblings who are seeking to cross borders in search of safety, a better life. We continue to pray for the members of our community who are recovering from surgery or illness, for Ruth Borfein, for Alexandra Elman, Latanya Goodson, Ernest Larkins, Jessica Rain, and Charlie Varela. We also pray for Ernest's family on the loss of his mom last Saturday. God, we ask you to be with his precious family as they grieve. And we ask God to be with all of us as we seek communal safety and communal well being. Let's join our voices together as one in the words that we learned from Jesus, the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Tara Lawyer, and I am the program manager for the Homecoming Project at Impact Justice which is a research and innovations nonprofit that seeks to reform our criminal justice system here in Oakland, California. We like to say that home is where someone's story begins. And this program is especially personal to me because of my own story. At the age of 18, I was incarcerated for 15 years. And now you would think that the day I was released would have been the happiest day of my life. However, I was very afraid. The challenges I had to navigate on the outside were something that prison never prepared me for. On that day, I was simply given $200 in gate money and sent on my way. There were exhausting and seemingly endless barriers to reentry. For me, I thought, where would I sleep? How would I eat? And if I would even be accepted by the community I was returning to? This is why housing in the first months after release from prison is absolutely critical. So we ask ourselves and others, what if it's the community that's the key to reentry? And from there, the homecoming project was born. Our participants who have served 10 or more years in prison are matched with hosts who have a spare room in their home. They live as part of a neighborhood connected to all the vital aspects of community life. Each participant is given six months of housing in a welcoming community residence with a private bedroom and wraparound support from community navigators. Hosts receive a stipend and orientation, training and ongoing support. Let me give you an example. London was sentenced to more than 13 years in prison. In 2019, at the age of 32, she was released and suddenly found herself with nowhere to go. She had no job or stable home and no family in California. She was overwhelmed and anxious about the fact that she had no income, even buying a meal dipped into what little savings she had. London was connected to the homecoming project through the Legal Services for Prisoners with Children one of our partner organizations that she was volunteering at at the time she was released. The Homecoming Project matched her with host Sabina, who welcomed London into the condo she owned in Oakland with open arms. Now let me show you a picture of Sabina in London. Using a stipend from the Impact Justice, Sabina was able to purchase furniture and bedding for London's room, taking care to make it warm, welcoming, and comfortable. When London walked in on that first day, she choked up. She never had a room of her own before. And here is London enjoying her own room and her own space. And from there, the pair's partnership blossomed. They actually became friends. Sabina helped her adjust to normal routine tasks like driving and cooking. Sabina was the, actually the first one to take her driving. London had no idea what Uber was or how to use the app. Things went so well that after six month period, they negotiated their own separate lease agreement so that London could continue to live with Sabina. Today, London is a program manager at a nonprofit where she works with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people to heal from their trauma. Your support in helping people like London build a new life. Over the next few weeks, my colleagues and I are thrilled to share more about how the Homecoming Project is giving so many people right here in the Bay Area, not only a second chance, a new beginning and hope for the future. Thank you so much for your support.
a few announcements that I want to call your attention to before we do the benediction. The first is, I think you all know, but just in case you don't, next weekend, starting on Friday, September 17th, is our all-church retreat. We are at a group campsite at uh, Lake Chabot Regional Park. We're not right at the lake, though. Uh, the campsite is called Lost Ridge, and we will be there from Friday afternoon to Sunday morning. And you are welcome to come to any or all of that time, but please register if you are going to come because we need to know who's gonna be there and we need to know who's coming when because we are behind a locked gate. So we have to make plans. We have to get the gate code to the right people. So please register for when you're going to come. Um, if you have questions, if you're trying to figure out when you should come. The registration form now has a few extra details about what's happening when, so you can find that out. The registration form is in the comments, it's also in the Carillon, it's on the Facebook page, it's all over the place on the website. You can find the registration form. I hope that you will consider coming. I think it's gonna be a really sweet time to see each other outdoors in a safe way. Um, and I invite you to all join me in praying this week for decent uh, temperatures and clear air while we're on that so that we can enjoy being outdoors together. Uh, so that is the All Church Retreat. We will have an online service at 10 as per usual on Sunday. This is just like when we used to do All Church Retreats at Camp Kaz. So if you are staying at home, you are very welcome to join the online service. It'll have a few tidbits from the weekend, um, but it will still be a very sweet service. So you're very welcome either way. I hope I'll get to see you. Um, Today, as always, you are invited to join Chancel Communion on Zoom, which is a very sweet communion time with um, some other folks there. So be in community there. You are very welcome to join the after party. We are trying a new thing where you can self-select into your discussion groups. So um, that could be fun. Maybe I will see you there. Um, you are also invited to a learning hour today at 1215 on microaggressions around disability and mental health. Um, we're working on making our community more welcoming. Uh, so learning about ways that we can make each other feel and uh, experience better welcome here. So please, please do consider joining that learning hour at 1215. Um, and I want to I uh, invite you to mark your calendars for October 3rd, uh, Sunday, October 3rd. There are a bunch of things happening. Um, the first is if you're newish, if you have not become a member, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this church, we have the next Discover First Church event, um, which you can sign up for. You can come um, learn about church, learn learn about a few other people, get to know people a little bit more. There's no obligation to make any formal commitment afterwards. It's just an invitation. So um, Discover First Church on October 3rd. There is also Lawn Church, outdoor church service on October 3rd at 4 p.m., same time as usual. Um, and this will be the blessing of the animals. So you are invited to bring a pet 
who is amenable to coming to a group of people or you are invited to bring a picture of your pet or a stuffed animal um, or you are just invited to bring yourself because after all we are all animals and we all deserve to receive that blessing so the blessing of the animals followed immediately by an outdoor movie screening a movie about saint francis that i highly recommend and uh, an opportunity for youth, middle school and high school aged youth and their parents to do some discernment about youth programming for this year. Um, all that will be outdoors. It will be an enjoyable time, I'm sure. And I hope I'll see you for some or all of it. So that's October 3rd. Mark your calendars. It's a big day. Lots of other stuff going on. Please do read the carillon and keep on top of stuff there. And in the meantime, I invite you to take a deep breath, to be present, in your space, in your own body, and to receive the blessing that God is offering you. The blessing of being a creature of creatures. Be at home in your body. Be at home in your ecosystem. Be at home in God's world. Be welcome. You belong here. And pay attention. The blessing of being a local is yours if you reach out for it. Receive all this in the name of Jesus Christ who walked his own ecosystem and who leads us home into the world. Amen.